Hello. Um, okay, welcome to the second lecture of the of three of um, this academic uh, training to 2023. Uh, we have Isabella Mazina and Giuseppe Lopresti on Zoom today uh, for the physics of music. So today there will be a more uh, theoretical lesson on uh, on uh, consonance and dissonance and other topics. So, Isabella. Yes. Is yours. Thank you. Okay, so we start. The, there is a lot of material today, so I just uh, start from the um, content contents. So we we try to to have a look at this issue, consonance and dissonance. So first, a discussion of the result of the test that we carried out for diets that were introduced yesterday by. Uh, Giuseppe, then our uh, modeling of consonance and dissonance for diets, with some hint about the history of the measure of consonance and dissonance, which is, a, of course, a fascinating topic, uh, dating back from Pythagoras. Every scientist tried to give uh, his own uh, formula for uh, the consonance and dissonance, so we tried to. And then some introduction, yeah, introductory um, uh, concepts uh, from Pythagoras about scales and temperaments, especially about the number of the notes. So this, the, the question why seven white uh, uh, keys and why five uh, black keys, uh, so 12 in the chromatic scale. Anyway, start from the results of our test. So just to um, Recall, uh, we asked people uh, what is the degree of consonance. Um, they should, uh, they, they gave um, a score from one to five. Now the results are normalized to a scale from zero to one. And this uh, consonance was defined according to, 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 to our definition in the, st in the test, not really as if you like or don't like, which is quite subjective, but does the two mm, sounds melt well or not, not so well? So it was quite a, mm, a kind of trial to be more objective about the, uh, uh, the sound, not really if I li want to use it to compose my music or not. Uh, so, and this is consonance. Uh, dissonance is simply in a scale from normalized to one for consonance, dissonance is simply one minus consonance. This is our definition. Of course, uh, you, you can work uh, with our convention. This is just to clarify what we interpreted as to be consonance and dissonance. And these were the results. So um, I recall you, we wanted to go beyond the octave because there were no data because beyond the octave and we needed data. And uh, we also um, presented to people some microtonal intervals, though these curious, some curious fractions that are not written there, but correspond to some intermediate notes uh, between, so notes not existing in the piano keyboard, let's say. So, um, good, what to say? Important thing, this was a, um, some neutral timbre. It was not a piano, because if you use a piano, you uh, have some cultural effect that cannot be neglected. The timbre of the piano is very complex. Usually people understand, uh, recognize, especially pianists, they like so much thirds, while if you present a, some neutral sound just obtained with harmonics descending as one over n, this is more say not nice <laughs> as the piano, but it is in a sense more controllable. And you are less uh, influenced by your memories about the piano or some specific instrument, violin or whatever. So mm, these were, you heard uh, a few of the, of the intervals and uh, you see, uh, people agreed. You see the error bars are large, but not so large, 20 people, Mm, many friends, colleagues <laughs> participated. So the gold is for sure the simplest ratio, two over one. Uh, notice the, the simplicity of the numbers associated to the winners. 
gold. So uh, in uh, the first line, really, it's the octave, perfect octave in musical notation. Then what we see is uh, the silver, the fifth, for the first octave. And people agreed. <laughs> no, no question about this. The silver also to this nice ratio, three over one, which is the um, compound fifth in the second octave, and also the compound uh, octave. So four over one. And, and you see, uh, the result is also that the compound octave is not really as the one octave. It, there is a little, mm, uh, little something below. Now, the bronze. Okay, here we have the perfect four. Now, I included also the major sixth. You see, it is quite arbitrary, the fact that I, I settled <laughs> my line here to have the major third in the other category. It's subjective. I had to do <laughs> some choice. So let's uh, see the perfect four, the major sixth with the large error bar. There are different opinions about the sixth. <laughs> And you have a bronze also here in the composite major third, which is the tenth. It's very appreciated by musician. And uh, so, you see, these are quite uh, uh, reasonable results. You have uh, the woods, I, I, I mean the fourth. <laughs> so uh, the wood medal is for major third than and composite uh, perfect fourth and composite major sixth. Then the quite dissonance, quite dissonance are the minor third and ma minor sixth and many intervals in the second octave. There is no one here, no one of them goes be below this line. While the last are, ah, no, no, sorry. There, there are, ah, first, there are some intruders in the category of the minor third. These are this kind of microtonal intervals, 9 over 7, 18 over 11, 7 over 4. This is known as harmonic 7 because it's some harmonic <laughs> number 7. But they are not present in the key of the piano, in the keyboard of the piano. But they are not so bad, finally. <laughs> and here is the group of the last. They come in three groups. One group around the mistuned unison, one close to the fifth. You see, there is really a drop, drastic drop from the fifth down here, and the same for the octave. So, this is also associated to roughness, as uh, we saw yesterday. The mistuned is associated to uh, roughness, and you use it to uh, tune your instrument, precisely this effect. Uh, okay, so reasonable. Just let's have a look at the comparison between first and second octave, because there is something in music that is called octave equivalence, which is quite, but not fully, True. Uh, so in, for, in um, red uh, are the diatonic uh, scale, uh, sorry, the chromatic scale for the um, first octave. In blue, it's for the second. So I overlapped in order to, to see uh, what changes. And it, the change is that the, the more consonant diets are worse if compound in their compound version, but for the composite major third, which improves, and uh, musicians like uh, really a lot, tenth, if they can do in their instrument, of course. I can do with the harp. With the piano, you need uh, probably a uh, big hand. Um, anyway, uh, notice also this, that mistuned octave is less severe than mistuned unison because they, they improve, actually. All this, uh, they, they, they improve a, li a little. OK, so this is quite uh, reasonable. And just uh, to compare, 
with other tests, I added this slide. So uh, these are the results for the chromatic scale, so 12 in one octave. Um, our results are in red, and they are compared with the results by other tests, Schwartz, which is quite old, beginning of 20th century, Bulling, which is recent, uh, 218, and they use a piano timber. So the cultural effect of the piano is emphasized, but uh, uh, that's why we rather use this neutral timber in particular. Here, it is quite consistent here, uh, uh, but uh, just look at the thirds, the effect of the thirds on the piano. They are, uh, they are nice on the piano, but the piano <laughs> is made to have nice thirds and, and, and sixths. <laughs> it was really studied for this. While harpists, they, uh, we like, I, at least me, perfect four. It's piano, mm, for pianists are not so interesting. Anyway, this depends really on the instrument. That's why we try to avoid this. Now, uh, let's go to this issue. Is it possible to give some measure of consonance and dissonance? In the sense, is there some characteristics in the signal that tell us that this, we perceive it as consonance or, or, or dissonant? Um, I include the cultural effect here in the sense that the cultural effect is included in the data. So, Let's say that we are uh, from Western countries. We are used to this kind of music, and a bit of cultural effect is there, of course. So what are, let's say, the physical characteristics that Western music composition exploited? Because other cultures exploited different physical characteristics, uh, but we are not studying <laughs> them here. We are studying the physical characteristics of the associated to the Western musical tradition. Oh, so. Um, is it just aesthetical or there is some physical characteristics, I, I said. So this is the study that we, we realized. We, we started with the, by teaching our lectures because we were just uh, uh, very happy to, to study the physics of music and we realized that, that there was something uh, possibly to do. So this is the, uh, the paper I, I just mentioned uh, here, the... Uh, the abstract, but I, I cannot go really in too much details. Uh, anyway, our study was the fact for diets, diets of combining two approaches. One is compactness, and the other, the other is roughness. So roughness is associated, as we will see, to beatings, but we, we had a presentation yesterday by Giuseppe with many uh, auditory examples. Compactness is rather associated in our definition to uh, some physical characteristics of the signal which is associated to the fundamental bus. So the frequency of this signal. But I, I will come in, in, uh, in a moment. So let's take uh, the frequencies F2 and F1 of the diet. Let's put them in, written in this way as yesterday, M over N, where M and N are integers. In simple form, no prime factors in common, so um, it's, it's obvious. This is bigger than one, so F1 is the lowest, and work out what we call indicators of consonance and dissonance. So some numerical measure that we will then normalize to, from zero to one to compare it with the um, result of the test, of course. So the compactness approach, this is a bit our definition of compactness. We invented this term just because it, 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 we liked it. Compactness is approach has two, mm, has two uh, subcategories, actually, uh, we, we realized according to our analysis. One is associated to periodicity and one to harmonicity. So let's see first periodicity. What does it mean? That according to our definition, but it's, uh, you, you see, reasonable. Shorter, the shorter is the period of the fundamental bus with respect to the periods of the dyad's tones, so F1 and F2, more there is consonance. This is pretty obvious if you um, think a little bit, because the fundamental bus is 
this missing fundamental, this virtual pitch is F0, we'll call it F0, which is given by F1 over N or F2 over M. And it is the fundamental bus is this uh, red uh, a frequency, a sine wave with the frequency of the fundamental bus is this red dotted uh, curve. While in blue there is the combined waveform, the signal as a function of time, associated to these different frequency ratios. So um, if you have a fraction, let's say nasty fraction, 9 over 8, you have beatings. Uh, some sort of beatings you see, blom, blom. Uh, while if you have different uh, um, ratios, you have different characteristics. Um, so the fundamental bus is the period, has the, the period of the fundamental bus is the period of the combined waveform, the sum of the two um, sign associated uh, to the frequencies F1 and F2. You just do the sum and you obtain this. So you see, mm, in, in essentially, nice intervals, the octave, has a very short period for the fundamental bus. Uh, while uh, also the fifth, then you see uh, mm, what is this? A perfect four and major six on the same level, a major third, it's worse, and uh, look this, this is, uh, and these are, are the worst. Um, as for the length of the period of the fundamental bus. Now, uh, this is for the period. Let's try to build, uh, you know, mm, in order to have some indicator, dimensional analysis is always a great resource for physicists because if you want to compare something which has a dimension, you have to find something else with the same dimension and build the ratio. So it's a dimensional and it gives you some characteristics of your system, whatever it is. So we, here we have essentially to compare the frequencies F1 and F2 with the frequency of the fundamental bus. So it, it is written the same. The higher is the frequency of the fundamental bus with respect to the composing frequencies F1 and F0, the more you have consonants. So you can build, a, define two basic consonance indicators, which call them uh, indicator of periodicity number two, because we have two here, and indicator of periodicity number one, because we take F1. And they are just equal to one over M and one over N. Let's try it. Now, if you, you can think uh, even at more uh, sophisticated possibilities, of course. Why not to compare F0 with some mean, algebraic, geometric, harmonic mean of the two composing frequencies? Arithmetic, geometric, harmonic mean, yeah, why? You build three different indicators associated to F0 over Fa, which is equal to this, for the geometric mean, you, you obtain this, and for the harmonic mean, you obtain that. They are more or less equivalent because the geometric mean are geometric mean. They are not so different <laughs> after all. So these are indicators which are, let's say, in between these two. We give prediction in between these two, naturally. And um, so this is a category of indicators that you, you can build exploiting the mm, characteristic, physical characteristic of the signal associated to the global frequency uh, of the sound of the diet, which is physical. Um, then, let's focus to discuss um, uh, in particular one indicator as a representative example. We realized, that, but after <laughs> that, this kind of uh, indicator, one over M, the one over M, is somewhat related to old arguments about the so-called coincidence theory. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, formulated Galilei, but by many others uh, in the same, even before uh, Galilei. And, and so this was the period of the 16th century, and it was uh, fashionable up to the 18th century, let's say beginning of the 18th century. 
And Galileo, with his huge uh, physical science, did not spoke of F0, fundamental bus, but nevertheless, he came out in the um, uh, Discorso su due nuove scienze with the number of strikes of the sharper string being in coincidence with the strikes of the lower string. Uh, he was the son of a famous lutist, so he was, uh, let's say, very friendly with this kind of things uh, and how strings were uh, solicited. And uh, here are the results of this 1 over m. For instance, there is this m is the upper, so it's the numerator. So you have 1 over 9, 1 over 5, 1 over 4, well, that's nice. And these are the original drawings of Galileo about the coincidence, because you count, yes, every, every strike, every maximum, let's say, you can also visualize this with the pendulum, as Galileo suggested. The number of strikes of the sharpest string is in coincidence uh, with the strike of the lower strings. It, it, this is given by this fraction. So here, 1 over 2 is in coincidence. Here, 1 over 5, blah, blah. Anyway, we are not really doing history of physics here. So let's go on. Because this uh, uh, kind of indicators, the, all this category, actually, the periodicity, has a, a problem which was uh, very well emphasized by contemporary people of Galileo uh, and many, many others. This was one critical point of the, the, this kind of approach, is that they are discontinuous. So uh, <laughs> what can you do? Uh, what are the predictions for some fractions which are close to the peaks but, not, uh, but do not sound so, so unpleasant after all? Uh, apparently, as far as we know, nobody uh, built a, a si this simple solution that for us is quite obvious, but well, make them continuous by Gaussianizing the peaks with some standard deviation which is associated to the discrimination limit of our ear. So you, can, you have this indicator, tilde means that I have normalized it from 0 to 1, which is better, then takes uh, uh, the maximum of the uh, consonant indicator, but smoothed with this peak where sigma is associated to the uh, discrimination limit, and you have uh, x, whatever, uh, from 1 to 2, where you want to explore your, your ratio. And this is uh, associated it is, let's say, a post-addiction because it is associated to our discrimination limit of the year. Okay, how it looks in this way. Uh, this is a representative example. The other are, are quite similar in the category of periodicity. So this is the Galilei in honor of, of Galilei, even though it was not really uh, phrased in this, in this uh, sense by, by Galilei. And you see... Well, one can be quite happy. There is something uh, good, you see. But, but uh, if you uh, want to calculate, for instance, the reduced key square, because as a theorist, we want to, to have uh, some key square, otherwise we are not happy. Well, the reduced chi square, uh, so your model is good, you know, if the chi square is of order uh, is less the or order one at most. It is not good if it is bigger, but of course it depends also on the kind of error bars that you have. Anyway, you see the reduced key square is uh, pretty honorable, and you can see that uh, you can conclude well, it's quite good. But but if you want to be uh, precise, consonant peaks here are not really reached, and also there, especially for the second octave. So it's why also it is important to look at the second octave and not, not forget about this. And uh, because in the first octave, <laughs> it, pre it behaves even better. But for the second, you see, there is something missing. Anyway, mm, good. OK, let's go on and uh, discuss the harmonicity category. It's pretty obvious also this. 
more harmonics coincide in the spectrum of the two frequencies F1 and F2, more you expect that there is consonance. And historically, this argument has been put in forward since the discovery of harmonics. So uh, during, after, uh, the, in, in the 18th century, essentially, 18th, 19th century, uh, you, if you studied uh, uh, music, Rameau, <laughs> the fundamental bass of Rameau, and all the, the uh, building of harmonic theory on the spectrum of the fundamental bass, and other people less known are Steve, Tartini, Pizzati. Uh, they all tried this, this approach, not in the numerical way we, we do now, because, I mean, the mathematics was different. The, 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 the approach was, was different. But uh, there was something. Anyway, we realized that these indicators, actually, from the numerical, po numerical point of view, turns out to be essentially equivalent to the periodicity indicator. So if you ask uh, periodicity, you have harmonicity, and vice versa. Because it is obvious, <laughs> let's say, after, after you think the more there are common harmonics, the more you will have the <laughs> fundamental bus with the high frequency. So they are related. Anyway, let's present some representative example. Nice. The so-called percentage similarity indicator which was proposed recently by these people, Gill and Purves, recent. So it looks like this, n plus n minus 1 divided by n plus n. So you look, it's a bit a periodicity uh, of the harmo mean harmonic, but with the minus 1. Anyway, it, is, it counts the number of harmonics in common between F0 and F1, which is m, and the number of harmonics in common between F0 and F2, which is n, minus 1, because otherwise you count twice, the last, over the to total number of harmonics of F0, all this up to the first coincidence of the harmonics. The example will <laughs> describe better. You have, uh, take a major third. This is the low, low note, this is the high note, and uh, this is the first coincidence. The black represents the harmonic spectrum of the fundamental bus. So you really count the number of coincidences over the total number of the harmonics of F0 um, up to the first coincidence. So you have a measure of percentage similarity of these two frequencies. And it's nice, a nice indicator. Mm, here it is, uh, Gaussianized, uh, as, we, as we suggested. And uh, look, it, it is uh, similar to the Galilei, but you see here it exaggerates, while here it's low. So similar, but not fully. Anyway, it has a reduced chi-square, at least with our data, even very, very nice. <laughs> what to say? Good. Anyway, consonance peaks are not reached very well for the first octave and too much for the second. So, uh, again, there is something not fully satisfactory. Okay, so let's go to the other approach, the one associated to roughness. And uh, this is probably uh, more... Uh, um, Famous because it was uh, historically developed, um, especially by Helmholtz, in the beginning, the fall, sorry, of the 19th century, and was um, discussed uh, during all the 20th century. Uh, you relate, uh, you say that more harmonics are beating, more there is dissonance. But dissonance is 1 over minus consonance if they are normalized, so you, you got it. And here is an example. Always the major third. You're, you have, let's say, a C and a E. These are the harmonics of F1. These are the harmonics of E. And the, let's say, the critical bandwidth increases with frequency. So if you are, let's put it out of the critical bandwidth for the fundamentals, you are in the critical bandwidth for 
three beating with four, six with, uh, beating with uh, five. So there is some roughness. There is some dissonance associated to this kind of uh, uh, diet. Now, mm, here is uh, Helmholtz, and this is the picture that he, um, he did in his um, uh, very famous work in uh, the 1863. So look, here is dissonance. So this is a dissonance indicator originally, which is, however, naturally continuous. So it met an enthusiastic reaction, and this kind of view superseded the coincidence as unrealistic theories, which were seen as quite old, let's say. Uh, they had the, all the problems uh, that uh, I mentioned. There was no one which went, rendered them continuous um, before, uh, before Helmholtz. So, at least as far as I know. Um, then, also, the Helmholtz proposal was refined with time, and Plomp and Levelt are two authors well known in this uh, field. It's uh, pretty recent, let's say, <laughs> with respect to the other. Uh, they include the effect of the critical bandwidth in their analysis, and they write explicitly a mathematical formula for a dissonance indicator. And they say, okay, this is the dissonance between these diets, uh, F1 and F2, which is given by the sum over all harmonics. They take explicitly n equal to six, six harmonics. They attribute them equal weight in accounting for dissonance, the total dissonance, and uh, just calculate this uh, function g uh, for this uh, ij pair, which is associated to the roughness, the beatings, and this gx so has a maximum roughness, which is here at about one quarter of the critical bandwidth, which is this 30 hertz that we, 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 we heard yesterday. Um, okay, so there is a formula, there is a nice formula to be exploited, and this is the plot by Plomp and Levelt. Now, if dissonance goes this way, you see, consonance goes that the other way. So this dissonance indicator uh, is just uh, interpreting the consonance and dissonance to be complementary to one in a scale norm normal from zero to one. It is like this. Uh, wow, wow uh, nice. But if we just reproduce this, if we inspect it better, the choice of n equals 6, uh, as well known uh, in the, the, for people working uh, uh, who, who already saw these kind of things, the um, choice of 6 uh, is pretty ad hoc because uh, if you add harmonics, you add peaks, and it's a, a disaster if you add peaks uh, <laughs> uh, all uh, here. So uh, there is something unpleasant. The six, uh, the seven is this uh, dashed line. The six is the continuous line, and you see also the second octave is not so not not so. And if you calculate, uh, uh, sorry, if, um, also look at this. Uh, how can be major sixth um, better than the fourth, perfect fourth, uh, or a minor third better than major third? Uh, well, there are some features that do not really work. And indeed, the reduced chi square, it's Six, so even worse than the previous models. But uh, you see, in general, there is a prediction of too much consonance in general, especially for the dissonant diets. And this is pretty embarrassing because this was uh, constructed exactly to account for roughness uh, and beatings. Anyway, you can try, of course, to improve. This was just the first trial for this kind of approach. You can try to improve. One improvement was suggested uh, by these two physicists, Atkinson and Knopf, 78. And first of all, add proper weight to suppress the roughness effects for higher harmonics. For instance, put a weight of the kind one over n, uh, and our harmonic spectrum is one over n, so there is some matching. 
Uh, so let, this helps solving the, uh, the, the stability of your results if you add uh, more harmonics because we want this. Otherwise, uh, the indicator is not really a good indicator. Uh, we suggest to add also the effect of secondary bits uh, of the mistuned, uh, mm, uh, sorry, I, there is a mistake, of the mistuned octave and fifth. So mm, not just the uh, bits, uh, the first uh, order bits of the mistuned unison, but we added the secondary bits of the octave and fifth. And uh, because they are there, so if you include one, why not the other? And you realize that you obtain something slightly better. This is our, our let's say, best representative example for the roughness indicator, where there are these two features implemented. So this is stable over adding more harmonics. And there is the effect of the mistuned fifth and octave, which is this 8-5 strange notation we introduced. The chi-square is 3. And it's difficult to do much better playing with these, uh, the numbers associated. So you see, it's better. But in any case, there are there's two large consonants predicted for dissonance dyads again. So there is something which uh, uh, is not really satisfactory at the end. So I mean, the, the uh, uh, discovery of hot water. That try, we uh, had uh, rendered continuous the periodicity indicator, so it's easy now to add to the roughness. They are both continuous. Now, try to combine the compactness and the roughness approaches. After all, these two approaches, they do different job. The compactness gives price for the best fractions, for F0, mm, large F0, for the highest frequency of F0 simplicity of the harmonic spectrum, while the roughness just gives penalties if there are beatings. So they, they do a different job, actually. Uh, so let's try to, put, to, to, to mix them, to add them, and introduce the parameter f, which is the fractional contribution of compactness model, whatever it is, with respect to roughness model, whatever it is. So x and y are the specific model, whatever they are. You normalize, of course, because you want your, your consonant indicator, your total consonant indicator at the end to be uh, normalized from 0 to 1 to be confronted with the data. And you obtain, you study the reduced chi-square as a function of this parameter f, this fractional. So that here, if you f is 0, you have just roughness. And if f is 1, you have just compactness, the, the compactness model. You see that uh, this is just one um, combination of the two previous representative models, so the Galileo-inspired and the roughness uh, that I showed uh, before. This is just a representative example. And you see that the reduced chi-square has really a significant minimum or f more or less, let's say, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So, uh, and this is a specific combination, but actually, if you take any, and we did, combination of all possible models that you can uh, invent of the type uh, compactness and roughness, I mean, reasonable models, that if you study the combination, they all have this kind of dip, all close to um, F more or less 0.5. So the conclusion is, well, OK, so there is something. It is non-trivial that you have a reduced chi-square so small when you compare, when you add the two models. It is not obvious that uh, your, mm, the sum of two models is better than uh, any constituent model. It might not, absolutely not be the case. So the conclusion is that, well, this shows that compactness and roughness, as reasonable, of course, they are both essential ingredients to explain the physical characteristics of consonance and dissonance, at least in, in Western uh, tradition uh, of, uh, uh, for our, uh, our uh, answers. And that's it. Uh, here is the representative example. 
in blue. So it is the 50% combination of, let's say, the Galileo-inspired periodicity indicator and the roughness-improved uh, indicator. And you see that well, it is not obvious that point by point, where one is low, the other precisely compensate. It is not so trivial that uh, a combination of this kind really agrees with, with, with a, a really a nice uh, reduced chi-square with the data. And uh, emphasize again, it is non-trivial that the mean of two models is so much better than each separate model. Uh, this, uh, in, in general, does not happen. Okay, so this is for the uh, diets. Now, uh, of course, you can uh, think uh, how to extend this to triads. And, uh, of course, uh, with triads, you have three fundamental frequencies. So you have to work in the plane, F2 over F1, and you have a third frequency. So let's introduce F3 over F1. And you have a surface with peaks uh, of consonants. Here, violet is more consonants and red is more uh, uh, dissonance. And you see this kind of uh, peaks, round peaks, uh, this um, is an extension to triads of the gillian purves harmonicity indicator, for instance, and uh, uh, so not including roughness, just harmonicity, and you can look for the position of well-known chords, like major chords, in the rest position, first uh, inversion, second inversion. It's well-known that the second inversion of the major chord is very nice. So you, you really find something that you, you know uh, with a language that is, uh, let's say, um, more, uh, more understandable for, uh, for scientists that uh, when you read, uh, of course, manuals of music theory, the language is different. So I, I think for us it's evident that it is, uh, it's nice to see this result in this way. Anyway, using data from this uh, paper by Bulling et al., who studied, did a test for all, all the triads that you can imagine within one octave, you find that this model has a chi-square reduced uh, order one. So uh, this is even consistent with dyad's results. Wow, fantastic. Okay, at least we, we, um, we enjoyed uh, this. Okay. So uh, this is the, let's say, the part of the fit, how theoretical physics uh, has to face the, can face the, this, uh, this, kind, uh, this kind of uh, data. And uh, now let me go to uh, another, yeah, I'm still in time, to another uh, closely related argument. Now, from consonant and dissonance, we move to scales and temperaments. So it's more historical now. The, uh, the, my review, and I will try to give my, let's say, our answers that we, we gave to this question. Why seven, why 12 notes, uh, uh, finally? And um, we have to start above, in the sense that we have to start for ancient Greek music, which is our basis. And so I'm pretty fond with this because uh, as an artist, I really find my origins. And consonance was obtained in this uh, tradition, musical tradition, uh, by a suitable tuning of the strings of the chitarra, which typically had two strings, sorry, eight strings, these are the eight strings, or of the lyre, which was, le, le, let's say, the more, uh, popular version of the chitarra and had usually just four strings. The musical practice was melodic, with the voice singing at the unison or at the octave with the instrument, so very simple. And um, so let's uh, have uh, our eight strings. Uh, you go from the lowest sound here to the highest sound there. And uh, so take this uh, lower string fixed 
And the obvious question is now how can tune the other strings in a way that is reasonable and which is reproducible by all other people that eventually want to play with me. Uh, with the three best consonances, with the three best consonances of the uh, ancient Greeks, which were precisely gold, silver, and bronze, of course. <laughs> what else? So they had, first of all, in the monochord, you can very well listen that if you have your uh, ponticello, I don't know in English, there, so you have this kind of ratios for the length, and you have this kind of ratios for the frequencies too. So you have the gold, you have the octave, and the octave was called the apason, which means through all, yeah, through all the strings of the guitar. Nice. So I put them in red because in the harp they are in red. All, uh, let's say, Cs are in red. Good. Uh, what else? We can exploit the silver consonants, which is 3 over 2. And you obtain in this way, this is the lowest, you go up and you fix this, this second nicest consonants, which is 3 over 2, and you have the apente, which means through 5. Through 5 strings. The, the, the 5 strings they had. <laughs> and um, now, in the harp, the fifth is yellow, but I, 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 I decided to emphasize it with green. And uh, uh, the bronze consonants is diatessaron through four, and you have two, mm, two diatessaron actually here. You can you tune, and you draw it in blue, and the harp as the blue diatessaron. So if you are friend, friendly with the harp, you really see this visually in your instrument. Uh, OK, so now we have tuned the non-yellow strings. They are easy, easy to tune, because the octave, the fifth, and the fourth, you really uh, can tune by yourself. I was instructed to do this when I, I started to, to play. To play. And uh, what they obtained uh, were two equal tetrachords. So tetrachord means four, two sets, equal set of uh, two strings. I think I went, no, no, okay, no, there is no animation. With two middle strings tuned differently according to the modes. So you have two different, but equal, uh, sorry, tetrachord, which anyway are equal, the lowest tetrachord and the upper tetrachord, they are equal, and you can arrange the frequency of the yellow string in a way to reproduce different modes. And the um, diatonic, mode, diatonic modes in particular were of this kind, the Lydian, Phrygian, Dorian, where E and L stand for different ratios between the strings up and the upper and, down and down, lower string. Uh, now, modern names are quite different because, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> but in modern name for this uh, Lydian, old Lydian, is Ionian. Anyway, let's calculate the E and L fractions E is the epoch d'on, which means one eighth more. Yeah, just, just take the fifth and the fourth string. So you have this ratio and you obtain nine over eight. So the epoch d'on is one eighth more of unity. You have then also the lima. Take, uh, for instance, the third and fourth uh, strings of the Lydian mode. Just, just fraction, you can do, you calculate this. This is pretty <coughs> difficult to say, 256 divided by 243. This is the lima, the residue. So they are not, uh, there is not a factor of two mm, of difference between E and L. 
L is uh, uh, smaller than E, but it is not equal to one half. Now, listen to the Lydian mode. This EEL E EEL, which is also denoted as Pythagorean diatonic scale. What do you expect to listen? But it's our major scale. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not really, because we use equal temperament, but uh, that's it. It's very similar. If you listen notes uh, in sequence, I am not able to, to, to see, to hear a difference. Uh, maybe you, uh, um, not me. Anyway, so why Pythagoras? <laughs> Pythagoras come in with his school because uh, he, uh, according to the tra tradition, uh, literature tradition, uh, he did two big, big proposals. One is quite, uh, let's say, not really um, scientific, but uh, anyway. Uh, so the idea is that the three consonant intervals are associated to ratios involving only integers from one to four. So one, two, three, four. The tetractis. It means that these numbers are special for the universe and we can use just them. I am a bit uh, joking. So this was to stress the importance of using just these four numbers. And uh, from a more practical point of view, less mystic, let's say from a practical point of view, you, uh, you have, attributed to Pythagoras, a cyclic procedure to obtain tunings for the linear mode by ascending fifth. That I learned after 2,500 years ago. Uh, of Pythagora, I was instructed to tune my, my instrument in this way. Then I bought uh, an electronic tuner and uh, just worked with them. But uh, with the harp, you really do this every day <laughs> in case you don't have uh, an electronic tuning tuner. Uh, now, mm, I am a bit losing time. Uh, the Philolaus tetrachord. Uh, this is some artistic touch. The Athens School by Raffaello in Vatican, if you go there, you see Pythagora with the boy, possibly it repre this represents his scholar Philolaus, a uh, scholar, I mean, they were not really contemporary. Anyway, there is a strange uh, uh, tablet, uh, strange for us, but for them it was absolutely uh, understandable. This is the graphic representation of the ratios of the kitaras for fixed strings. And you, you, you find everything in this sort of diagrammatic uh, expression. Anyway, let's start building the Pythagorean scale. Start from the tesseron, because actually you start from the tesseron, it's the fa. So, uh, and, okay, it's a fa. Go now, uh, um, ascending fifth by a fifth is equal to descending by a fourth modulo one octave. So we descend by a fourth, which is equivalent to all, uh, all to as ascending by a fifth. And you have your do. And continue the process. Up, sol, go down, re, again, done. I managed to tune my small harp with eight strings and I updated the Lydian mode. And this scale, and other modes, of course, were used for centuries, including Gregorian singing. And the names of the note were, uh, as you know, uh, apart from the C, um, were introduced by Guido, uh, Guido d'Arezzo, which was a monk in Pomposa, was close to Ferrara, so everything is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, interesting for me. Um, so these are the notes, and they, uh, Gregorian singing was using this kind of Pythagorean uh, suggestion to, to tune, uh, to tune uh, instruments. But let's turn to our model. 
uh, our model, our representative model in blue, just one octave because two octave is too much. And um, where are the Pythagorean scale uh, notes? So I put now the uh, strings with the distance among them that really represents the distance in the interval between each successive note. And in top, I put the position in our, let's say, composite model, um, combined model of periodicity and roughness. You see, of course, uh, the, these are the peaks. The fourth, uh, it was built uh, precisely for this reason. Um, but you see in here uh, the major third and the sixth are not uh, uh, really good. Anyway, what are the advantages of this kind of uh, uh, tuning? That all fifth are given by e square, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, to the cube times lima. Are, they are all perfect. They are all equal, but uh, this uh, uh, diminished fifth, c c uh, which is different, but this is diminished. Then you see the distance between all fifth is the same. Physically, you see it's the same in this logarithmic scale. And what about the fourth? The same. They are all equal. So it was really uh, easy to tune and uh, say easy, uh, anyway, uh, singing by a difference of perfect eight, perfect five, fifth, and perfect four. And this is the basis of Gregorian singing, actually, the maximum of consonants, maximum of uh, perfection, let's say, in, in consonants. Uh, they stress this kind of uh, approach to, to composition. But then, look uh, also at the disadvantages, of course. As I said, third and sixth are not at their best. And one, once, uh, when <laughs> at a certain stage, uh, counterpoint, polyphony, and organs uh, were developed. Uh, this path for composition were explored. This led to abundant Pythagorean scale by upgrading third and sixth to imperfect consonances. And we will see tomorrow with Giuseppe this natural scale by Zerlino is a, an example. Then the second disadvantage is that including the chromatic scale, um, the circle of fifth do not close. Uh, who heard about the circle of fifth that do not close? <laughs> you remember this still. Um, and the, solving this problem, which was developed essentially in the Middle Ages, um, uh, you, um, you go as a solution towards tempered scales. And this will be for tomorrow. Just me, let, just me show you uh, the chromatic scale, scale uh, according to Pythagoras. So we ascended by fifth or descended by fourth, which is equivalent to doing this kind of uh, uh, circle uh, going uh, to, to, to the right. Uh, so let's continue. Let's add uh, some other string. And let's continue starting from where we arrived. We were at the B. Uh, F diesis. Sorry, F sharp. C sharp. G sharp. D sharp. A sharp. But we are falling on an E sharp, which would be an F prime, but this F prime is a bit exceeding our uh, previous F, our starting point. And it exceeds by some, something which is known as Pythagorean comma, which is about one quarter of tone. So if you hear F and F prime um, in sequence, yes, there is, uh, we calculated 10 hertz of frequencies. You might hear something, but you really hear them in beatings. Ah. Uh, by the way, of course, they cannot close because of a mathematical uh, thing that 3 over 2 to the n, is not, there are no n and m which can satisfy this numerical uh, property. OK, but I was saying, let's listen to the beats between f prime and f.
So the conclusion is, well, no, no we don't use F prime, uh, forget about it. Uh, let's try it to the other direction. So now, again, from fa, sorry, F, we go uh, now, we go down by a fifth, and we go the other, the other way. Uh, first of all, reproduce all you have at the, at the lower octave, and then go down. Let's dis descend. Oh, well, you have a B fl uh, flat, which is below in frequency with respect to A sharp, obtained before. Uh, okay, let's continue, go up. Again. Again. So, conclusion, impossible to make flat and sharp coincide for all uh, black uh, key, uh, keys uh, in the keyboard. And so, solution, you can envisage uh, various solutions. Uh, select just 12 in, in the sense that you use the seven white and you select five black among we obtained and do not play a specific interval known as the Wolf Fifth. This is an example of a specific choice for the blacks. Take two descending, so uh, e and, uh, um, sorry, B and E mm, flat, not the other, and just three asc ascending uh, mm, flats, sorry, um, sharps. And you, so ignore the gray, and you just take the black. Uh, you, you can do, of course, this, but there is a little problem. Is, is that there are fifth, for instance, this one, uh, they are equal, G sharp and E flat, which are mistuned, which are mistuned, so it's better not to play them. They are too small, actually, because the, uh, the circle of the fifth, let's say, uh, does not close because uh, you, you exaggerate uh, with your cyclic uh, procedure. And so the remaining, the, all the fifth are perfect, but this is too stretched, too, too small. And let's hear, of course, it. While the perfect would be much more stable. So you can work with this. I mean, just don't touch if you don't want to this keyboard uh, together. And uh, that's it. But historically, of course, you want to, to do even always better. And the other solution will be discussed by Giuseppe in the next lecture. One direction is, uh, you, you might know, of course, is to temper, to flatten your fifth and um, select, uh, again, 12 notes, avoiding, if you temper your fifth in a convenient way, um, Wolf's fifth to not, not pleasant fifth as, as much as you can, or take more than 12 uh, keys. Why not? So, and we will also see microtopes in the, in, in the next. So thank you for the, your attention. I was a bit <laughs> uh, too long, but you see the material is so uh, wide and passionating that uh, uh, I thank you for, uh, for your uh, interest and we see you tomorrow then with the Giuseppe. Thank you very much. Uh, Isabella, I'm I'm seeing there's no questions in the chat. Do we have um, questions from Zoom? You can raise your hand. And otherwise I can give the microphone to Maria who can take questions from the room. I am going to stand here to look for raised hands. If any yes, just a moment. Could you have a look at the consonant map of the triads?
on the page 31, I think. Triads, yes. Ah, no, 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 sorry. I was uh, going <laughs> in the backup. Might take a while. We have to go here, okay. Yes. What are we actually seeing here? How, how are these, how was this obtained? This data? Uh, well, this is preliminary. This is an extension. Uh, I, I submitted it to the, to the review, <laughs> for the review. So uh, it is an extension to triads of the uh, harmonicity indicators by Jill and Purvis, the one that we saw here. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 sorry, I am going the other way. Uh, I have not learned how to use this. Um, the harmonicity is this one. So uh, I, I cooked up an extension a formula to extend to triads this uh, idea of Gillian Purvis, and uh, I cooked up an extension uh, to triads, so to two dimension rather than one dimension, and um, this was uh, a plot representing uh, representing this, where you see valleys of, let's say, roughness, because really there is roughness here. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, this is an harmonicity indicator. I did not include the effect on roughness, but you see the valley of dissonance and the peaks in violet, in purple, of consonance. You, you obtain this. Uh, of course, again, um, the extension to um, triads of the um, indicator by Gill and Purvis would be naturally discontinuous. So I um, gaussianized into dimension again, taking uh, as a, a Gaussian with uh, a deviation, a standard deviation equal to the discrimination lemon uh, of the ear. So uh, you have, that's why you have this um, sort of uh, uh, Gaussianized peaks as, as for uh, the case of dyads. Has an empirical measurement similar to what you did to dyads been done to triads as well? Uh, empirical in which sense? I mean, you, you ask people. Like you, you had ah, no, no, people. this is the model. I, I understand, but do you know if, if anybody has done that before? Um, triads. For triad, you mean this kind of extension, this model? Uh, I mean, just the... The test, the yes, yes, yes. The test, yes. Sorry, I was probably going too fast uh, when... Uh, so, Bulling et al., um, there is a paper by these people, Bulling et al., a recent paper, 2018, and they study uh, all the 66 triads that you can build within one octave, not two, you see here we, we are inside one octave for the triad, um, and they give, uh, for, for the just scale, uh, using the just chromatic scale. So you, you really have 66 triads for your uh, people <laughs> uh, participating into the test. And they, um, they did it with the piano. And uh, they had, if I remember correctly, uh, 20 people, um, I, I should check the paper. Anyway, uh, of course, in, in our uh, paper about diets, we cite uh, bowling. Uh, we cite, uh, you can find uh, the reference to, to bowling, which we found very useful, very, very interesting, because you see, at the beginning, I compared, first of all, our results with well other tests, and here, the results of bullying for the dyads, not for the triads, are in blue, because we wanted to check that uh, our results uh, were reasonable. And bullying did this also for the triads. 
the 66 triads. And so the chi-square that I showed you is based on the comparison between the model and the bullying data. Uh, but can you use the... We also have a question from Zoom for in, in a minute. I also find mind blowing that 3D graph. I, I, I would love to see more names for the simple triads, at, at, at least the ones that have simple names, just to. Simple names? Uh, I mean, it, 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 what do you mean? Where, yeah. where, where is the peak? Oh, well, there are many triads. Yeah. Okay. So the major at rest, well, you, you need a bit to, to, to read, of course. I, I, I did it so I know where to look. Um, you know, the major at rest is built with the major third, so um, five over four, and the other ratio, the F3 over F1, is a fifth, so three over two. And this is the perfect fifth. So if you read here, it's the major third, uh, okay, and the perfect fifth, you cross, and this is the peak of the major at rest. And the major in the second uh, inversion is done with the perfect four and a major sixth. The first uh, inversion is done with uh, a minor third and a minor sixth, and uh, you see, so these are the three versions of the major chord. For the minor, you, we have to go here. Minor chord up, 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 here. There is no peak. Because there is a highest peak close to it, which is pretty interesting. Very much. For microtonal people, especially. And uh, so it's preliminary. Uh, we, are, uh, we are working uh, on this, but you, you can find. Uh, this is just a harmonicity indicator, uh, just harmonicity. Then uh, you can, of course, do, uh, and, and the paper I, I did uh, try the periodicity, harmonicity, and. Uh, so. Okay, we, we have one question from Sotiris uh, from Zoom. Yes, hello, Isabella. Thank you. Um, to understand naively the, the mathematics of, of the frequencies that you do now, the ancient Greeks did it with lengths of chords. That's what you were saying? The numbers? The so, numbers, so the, yes. Are length, lengths of strings? Exactly, exactly. I was very, okay. very so fast. They did the math okay, sure. Yes, so, yes. And then they did this, if I understand well, they did the same thing as you, like people, thousands of people, like some uh, sounds, some co some uh, resonances, con uh, accord consonances, and uh, they discovered that these approximately that these peaks, uh, and you discovered that the, these peaks are about the same now. So the, my question is: still, we don't understand the reason why, do we? Why we? Why we ha you have these peaks in the um, uh, in the appreciation of of the uh, the sample of people listening? Right? Yes, yes, I agree. We don't know. Why. No, no, yeah, okay. we don't know how the ear actually works. The ear, the brain. Right. And we, okay. uh, this was so not a model. Yes, yeah, sorry. They did some mathematics with the length of the strings. They found some some uh, sounds that are pleasant, and we, you did the same with frequencies, huh? but still we, we have to, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mean, Thanks. of course, they associated uh, to length the numbers, they realized that they are simple numbers, and they were very fond of this. Now, yeah. you are yeah. saying that we did the same. I think yeah, not yeah, really. Yeah. In the sense that, first of all, we did uh, all uh, the, the study of all these kind of uh, uh, diets, 
then we tried a model that fits the data. We, are, we, don't, we don't want to explain why the ear functions in the way. It's not our role. We are just trying a fit why, the that way, why are there... describes the physical characteristics of the signal that produces in your ear, in your brain, this. Uh, and the physical characteristics are the simplicity, the compactness of this waveform in the sense of F0, fundamental bus, and of compact structure of harmonics. So your signal should be compact in order to appreciate it. This is one mm, face of, of this. The other face is that beatings are nasty. And so if you add um, a, uh, an indicator that express the fact that we really don't like, we, for us beatings are interpreted as uh, dissonance, you have these kind of features. These features are associated to, uh, to, to the roughness. So what we did is just to describe what are the physical characteristics of the signal, namely in the sense of compactness and roughness, that account for this kind of results. We are not going of certainly to explain how the ear actually works. It's a black box for us, the ear. And, and why, yeah, right, and why it is pleasant, okay, how it works and why we find this convenient, right? We don't really, apart from roughness and compactness, okay. Well, in some way, the ear appreciates a signal which is yeah. compact, let's say, few information, well understandable, uh, compact in, in the information that is inside, uh, inside it, and beatings um, are pretty nasty. You can have some explanation on this about uh, the function of, functioning of the basilar membrane, because if you have too close frequencies, then it is difficult for the basilar membrane to, uh, <laughs> let's say, move um, uh, in, in different, uh, according to these two slightly different places. But this is really something which is more on the side of biophysics. And of course, we did not uh, discuss this. There are studies, of course, about the functioning of the of the year, which are in progress. Uh, I mentioned this place theory yesterday, but there are also, also other theories. Um, I read about frequency theory and combination of them. Then there are non-linearities. And the fact that the ear even do better than the um, uncertainty principle, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle applied which is associated just with the fact that you have waves, um, the ear does better than the uncertainty principle. It is able to uh, understand, uh, let's say, the, um, the duration and the frequency better than you would expect by the naive uh, relation based on the uncertainty principle in the time frequency domain. So it's clear that the year is something that is fantastic, <laughs> and we don't we don't understand it uh, fully, of course. Okay, we we have another question in the room. I just wanted to ask concerning your statistics: Do you intend to extend your tests maybe to a larger audience? Twenty is, of course, not a large statistic. Twenty is, is not much, but we realize that was quite uh, quite good. Um, if we had, uh, let's say, if we increased the, the number of people, uh, we wouldn't sh um, sh shrink our error bars significantly because it, this is not the coupling of the Higgs uh, to the bottom that you do uh, statistics. And uh, I mean, pe every people, um, there, there is a subjective component. So by definition, they do not uh, give you the same uh, the same reply. So uh, we, of course, it would be better to have more people, but uh, it wouldn't 
uh, you, you cannot decrease your, uh, your error bars uh, in a significant way, any, anyway, even with, uh, let's say, 100 uh, people. And of course, the years are very different. So we realized that uh, we had a violinist uh, uh, in the IT division uh, who was the um, most precise ear that we had in our, in our set of, uh, of people, uh, uh, so a person playing violin. And um, he, he gave consistent results because we, uh, uh, we let people uh, give two answers for each diet, and he gave exactly the same answers. Why? Usually people, more or less educated, uh, you, um, you could have had uh, two slightly different uh, replies. And uh, even, even for the octave, even f you see there is an error bar in the octave, there is in the composite octave uh, for the fifth. So uh, uh, clearly, people who are trained, musicians, are, are trained, so they they know better what to, what to look for. But uh, I have to say that the second person, uh, let's say more precise uh, after this violinist, uh, is my mother, who <laughs> did not play <laughs> uh, better than me. <laughs> play, and I play. So you see, it's really subjective. But uh, of course, you have to avoid people that have problems because there are also a music, and then uh, you, you don't have to, to, to look for them uh, in order to, to, to build, uh, uh, to have this, this kind of plot, uh, of course. So there is some also common sense, uh, good sense uh, that you have to exploit uh, with this kind of studies. Last question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fascinating. Uh, artistic, historical, physics, everything is in there. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Uh, instead of extending the number of people participating in the test experiment, how about expanding the, the origins of uh, music? Like you said, we, uh, the base of the Western music is uh, Pythagoras, and uh, the piano and what we are used to from um, Middle Ages and Renaissance and the 18th century and so on. The ears are very different, as you say, of people, but human ear, even if we don't understand it fully, has a certain structure also in Japan, in China, in India, and... For example, Pythagoras, I trust, knew uh, Persian, I Indian music. So if we study them, they are full of semitones and very small fractions of the tone we don't have in Western music, and they find it fantastic. <laughs> Would this be an interesting field for further study for you? Well, for us, I... I, I... Uh, we will see. But um, what I can say is that uh, possibly, at, at least uh, we, we, according to us, there is some physical characteristic in the signal. Then, if you want to pursue, uh, and uh, even an Indian guy at CERN, uh, studying at CERN, working at CERN, participated, and he gave consistent results. Uh, uh, so he is inside also the Indian, uh, the Indian guy. He gave consistent results with, with respect to the other. No, no. Because if you really mm, are instructed that you have to say if the two sounds melt or not, this is a kind of quite objective. It is not uh, if I want to use for my music or not. Because you can, you, you might want to use dissonances for your music because you like uh, dissonance mutation. You are allowed, perfectly allowed, but then you go and pick precisely these diets which display 
roughness, tension, you are perfectly allowed. The Gregorian singing was different. They tried to do the uh, most consonants, as, let's say, Pythagoras, well, they Poor, poor guys, they had uh, eight strings uh, trying to tune them. Uh, I mean, if they did, <laughs> of course, they tried to do what they, was their best to have something uh, that might sound correctly. Uh, Gregorian singing, maybe the technical possibilities for an instrument were more refined. Uh, Gregorian singing really uh, chose to develop a style of music with. Uh, the most consonants, no dissonance at all. It was forbidden, uh, major third, major sixth, but, well, no, no, just the best, the best. Uh, it's a choice, it's a choice of style. Um, then, mm, I mean, uh, in the, more recently, let's say, seven, 18 centuries, uh, 17, uh, thirds and sixths started to be much very appreciated. And pianists, I think, they are fond of uh, third because also it's, uh, let's say, practical. You, you, what, what can you do? But possibly a, a fourth is even, let's say, you have to stretch. Well, for me, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, it depends really on the instrument and the style of what you want to do because you are perfectly allowed uh, to, to, to use uh, dissonances and you want to do this, um, uh, con con I mean, you are con mm, conscious that you want to look for this because you want to create tension. Jazz, for instance, which everybody knows, you, you want to use it. You are fond of dissonances, you are looking for them and also for something different than what was done from, from the other people who can, uh, let's say, be uh, more interesting than Bach. <laughs> let's try another, another path, uh, possibly. Okay, we have one last comment from, uh, from the chat from Mauro saying, uh, writing, I thought that the choice of seven as a number of notes was due to the fact that seven was the number of planets known at the time. Is it correct? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I think the Pythagoras and the Pythagoras school also associated to this, the harmony of the sphere. But uh, actually, I think more reasonably, it was based on tuning, in the sense that if you have your instrument, the eight, your eighth string, what you can do, poor guy, and you have to tune your, your eighth string. Just use fifth octave and fifth, uh, uh, fifth and fourth, because this, is, this, this gives you some uh, reasonable tuning. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you have many instruments, many harps, uh, many guitars, I don't know what. Uh, so also now orchestra, how guitar, guitar. I think many people will play guitar. How do you tune the guitar? The fifth, I've been told. Because you are able to, to do this by ear, by ear, and you wouldn't use a microtone. Okay, but okay. Well, special Let's... people do. <laughs> but I mean, the first, uh, the, the, the easiest thing also for, uh, let's say, non-expert uh, is uh, uh, octave and fifth. Okay. Thank you very much again, Isabella, for the great uh, talk and Q&A session. Thank you.